Hello, my name is Kim Eagle. I'm the director of the Frankel Cardiovascular Center at the University of Michigan. And I'm just delighted to be with you today to talk about uh, aortic dissection. This is a problem that I've been studying for, for more than 35 years. And I'm gonna explain to you today a little bit about what a dissection is and how, how doctors think about uh, evaluating it and managing it. I always like to start my talk with uh, disclosures that relate to either institutions or individuals who have supported our work and they're shown on this slide. Obviously, I'm grateful for support over the years uh, of research agencies who have valued the science that we've been pursuing. For my talk today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of where we are in terms of evaluating aortic dissection. And we'll talk about kind of what it, what it is, kind of how we classify it, how patients present, what some of the imaging uh, studies are and, and what they show us. And then of course, how we treat it uh, and at the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we currently think about longer term management. Uh, this figure is an important figure and it shows the aorta. In a way, it looks like a candy cane, doesn't it? And of course, the tube starts where the heart muscle, the left ventricle pumps blood into this very large artery. Uh, and then the aorta goes north and over something called the aortic arch. And then it goes down, traversing the body more toward the back. Uh, so the aorta is a very large artery starting at the heart and ending with the bifurcation of uh, the aorta into the major arteries to the legs. On the right side of this screen, you see a sort of a cross-sectional image looking at the wall of the aorta. And notice that there's a, a fairly thin lining to, the, to this tube. And then there's a strong middle part of it. We call that the media. And that contains all the elastic elements that are important to keep the aorta intact. And then there's an outer layer called the adventitia. So these three layers are all very important in terms of allowing uh, integrity of the aorta for human health. And of course, this artery takes a pounding with every beat. Uh, the aorta has to withstand that rush of blood into the artery and then help transmit it uh, with oxygenated blood to all parts of the body. This is a close up, which uh, really is asking the question, what happens in an aortic dissection. And the, the illustration on the left, I think is the most relevant for what I'm trying to talk to you about today. We think that for some reason, whether it's an inherited reason or potentially an acquired reason like hypertension or smoking, uh, that the lining of the aorta can tear. And that can allow blood to enter into that muscular part of the aorta called the media. Uh, and this can create a separate channel where this hemorrhage can actually extend down the entire aorta. So essentially it's an intimal tear that then allows blood to enter the media and that blood can then start a process where it propagates even over the arch and then down the entire aorta. So this is probably the simplest uh, way to explain what an aortic dissection is. It's a tear in the intima and then uh, a, a development of blood in the wall of the aorta called a hematoma. Uh, and obviously, if it starts to affect vital arteries to various parts of the body, it can be incredibly dangerous. In thinking about identifying patients with an aortic dissection, uh, this slide kind of il illustrates how clinicians, doctors think about this. Uh, on the top, we see that how the patients present, what kind of a symptom do they have? But to the left of the slide, you see, we think about, do they have any predisposing conditions that might make them more likely to have an aortic dissection. That might be a genetic problem or a familial tendency. Um, obviously, we use imaging and x-rays. Uh, the physical exam can be very helpful in evaluating a patient where we suspect aortic dissection. And we use uh, laboratory tests and something called an electrocardiogram too. And all of these various inputs allow doctors to think about, is this symptom likely to be an aortic dissection? And of course, anybody who has this condition gets medically managed, particularly blood pressure and heart rate and then some of them need additional treatment. How do we classify patients who have aortic dissection? There are several ways that we can do this. I think the simplest system that I, I like to use is something called the Stanford classification system. And on the left side of this slide, you see uh, a, an aortic tear where the aorta has been torn just above the aortic valve. So this is the early part of the aorta, the aorta before it goes over the top and down. So just above the heart muscle, that section of the aorta is called the ascending aorta. When the ascending aorta is involved, we'll call that a type A 
dissection, no matter how far it extends, if the ascending aorta is involved, it's a type A. The figure on the right uh, is something called a type B, and typically that tear of the aorta is beyond the branches of the aorta that go to the head. Uh, and so that, that type of an aortic dissection by convention has been classified as a type B. This classification is very important because if the aorta is involving the ascending part, the type A, we consider that to be a surgical emergency. That type of aortic dissection tends to cause a very high likelihood of mortality. And we try very hard to get those patients to the operating room to repair those as soon as we can. In the past, we used to classify acute aortic dissection as anything within 14 days of when a patient had symptoms. But more recently, we've understood that this is um, really not granular enough for the truth. And I'm gonna go to the next slide and we're gonna talk about what we currently think in terms of time. I'm gonna limit your focus here to the upper graph. And this is patients who have a type A aortic dissection presenting to our international study in which we've examined what happens over time after they come to the hospital. And what I want you to appreciate is the bottom graph, or the, the bottom curve in this um, upper graph relates to patients who for one reason or another don't get to the operating room. They have a type A dissection, it's involving that ascending aorta, but they don't get an operation. In this first 24 hours, I call that the hyperacute period, and you see that if you don't get to the operating suite, we've lost about 20% of those patients, they die. And if you look at the next six days from day two to seven, we lose another 20 to 25%. I call that kind of the acute. The subacute phase is from day eight to 30, and then after day 30, we'll call that chronic. So what's really important about this graph is the fact that on average, a patient with a type A aortic dissection has a 1% per hour mortality in that first day. So we've got to find those patients and get them to the operating room for repair. Otherwise, the mortality risk is just overwhelming. Um, obviously, the type B dissection is a different place in the aorta. And when we can, we try to treat those patients medically, but some of them do need further interventions. What I've shown on this slide is um, the patients in our international study and Rather than uh, focus so much on the three different time points, I'm just going to have you pay attention to the left side of the slide. And notice that the average age of a patient who has an aortic dissection today is about 62. Roughly two thirds of them are men, a third are women. And notice that the type A aortic dissection applies to about two thirds of the patients that we see. The most common risk factor out there is hypertension. That's seen in at least 80%. Um, there's a rare condition called the bicuspid aortic valve, and that's responsible for about three or 4%. You might've heard of Marfan syndrome. That's a genetic problem of the aorta. That's present in three to 4% of patients who have an aortic dissection. Cocaine use, particularly in this country, is a cause of aortic dissection, one to 2%. Familial uh, aortic disease is very important. And in the IRAD experience, this international study, currently about 10% of patients uh, with aortic dissection have clear evidence of a familial gen genetic problem. Uh, and obviously, uh, this is an area where the John Ritter Foundation and the science of Diana Milowitz and others is working hard to find the genes that are responsible for those families that have aortopathy and aortic uh, dissection. If you ask the question, how do patients with aortic dissection present? The overwhelming answer is pain. 95% of patients have pain. And this slide illustrates the fact that most of them, 85%, it's abrupt in onset and it's often terrible. And it's even, it's usually in the chest or in the back, or sometimes it's in the belly. The patient will often describe it as sharp and sometimes as tearing. But the thing that really designates aortic dissection pain for doctors is how it starts in an instant and is horrible. Patients have a photographic memory of where they were at, what they were doing when this pain started. Fainting or stroke is the other symptom that can happen, and that's about 10% of patients where the dissection itself has affected blood flow to the brain in such a way that the patient passes out or has slipped into a coma or has had a stroke. When doctors encounter a patient with a suspected aortic dissection, they're paying attention to several key parts of that patient's presentation. They're looking at their blood pressure, 
and some patients are hypertensive when they have a dissection, some are actually low, but they're especially looking for two features that are quite characteristic. If that ascending aorta is involved, that dissection can push down on the aortic valve leaflets and the valve can leak, and that can cause a murmur called aortic valve insufficiency, AI. So we're listening to the heart to see if there's aortic valve insufficiency. Also, when that dissecting hematoma goes over and affects the aorta, it can cause a limitation of blood flow to the arm or to the legs, and that can create something called a pulse deficit, where the blood pressure, say, in the left arm is different than in the right arm. So doctors are focusing on evidence of a new heart murmur, and also if there's any evidence of a problem with one of the pulses to one of the legs or the arms. If you ask the question, how do doctors kind of filter all of this together, they do it this way. They think about patients who may have high-risk conditions, and they're seen on the left side of this slide. We talked about Marfan syndrome, a family history of aortic disease, a known aortic valve problem. Uh, if the patients have their aorta manipulated lately, like heart surgery or with a catheter, uh, or do they have a known aneurysm? In the middle part here, you see, do they have high-risk pain features? And particularly that one I talked about, abrupt onset, boom, of pain in the chest or the back or up in the neck. And then on the right side of this slide, you see high-risk exam features that we talked about, a pulse deficit, a problem with the blood pressure, a murmur of aortic valve insufficiency. What this slide illustrates to us, and this is a study of over 9,000 patients with aortic dissection, is that um, it's very rare for a patient not to have at least one of these factors. And in fact, only about 10%, uh, less than 10% have none of these. And of those 10%, if you look at their x-ray, their aorta looks big on the x-ray. What this illustrates to me is that if our physicians pay attention and look for the high-risk conditions, the high-risk pain features, and the examination, we think that we can diagnose about 95% of patients who have aortic dissection. Because this disease is so rare, currently we think that it's often missed because physicians are thinking about something that's much more common, like a heart attack. It's 100 times more common or a clot to the lungs, that's 20 times more common. So one of the things we're doing with the John Ritter Foundation and other organizations like the Marfan Foundation is trying to distribute education to physicians out there in emergency rooms, et cetera. Focus on these simple features that allow us to have a much better chance of identifying patients who have an aortic dissection. What about the chest X-ray? Is that useful? And I just mentioned it, that the aorta, when it dissects, is enlarged. And so this, this x-ray variable, chest x-ray, wide mediastinum or aorta, that is seen in at least half and as high as 70%. And so that also can be a clue when a person's in an emergency room with chest pain, that wide aortic shadow on the chest x-ray can be uh, evidence. So wait a minute, I got to, that aorta is enlarged. Maybe it's been torn by an aortic dissection. If you look at what type of imaging is done to evaluate patients with aortic dissection, for the most part, it's CAT scanning. This is commuted, you know, computed tomography. It's a rapid X-ray that goes around the body and looks at whether or not the aorta is torn or enlarged or both. And what you see here on this slide, I mainly want to call your attention to the data with the CAT scan. It's about 98% sensitive. So if a patient comes with an aortic dissection and the doctors think about the diagnosis and move to a CAT scan, the likelihood that they're going to find this is extraordinarily high in the 98% range. Some, some emergency departments have magnetic resonance imaging right there, and that has a similar sensitivity. Uh, sometimes patients get something called a, a transesophageal echo, where an echo probe is put down into the esophagus, and we look at the aorta through a little scope. And that's very good for type A dissection of the ascending aorta. It's not as good for uh, dissections that happen in that descending portion. And that's why you see the sensitivity here is less than 90% for the echocardiography type test. I'm not going to go through this in any detail. I simply wanted to show you that, that this is kind of the process that doctors use when they think about evaluating and managing a patient with aortic dissection. And we talked about the history, the prior conditions, the physical exam, and the x-ray. And then they, if they find a dissection, the question is, is it type A involving the ascending aorta? or type B, not involving the ascending aorta. And if it's type A, we're thinking it's an emergency to go to the operating suite. And if it's a type B, often we can manage those medically unless there's a complication and some of those patients will need either a stent graft where we fix the aorta from the inside or sometimes an open operation.
I wanted to illustrate that we're getting better. We're getting better. The graph on the right shows the percentage of in-hospital death over three different time periods uh, in the IRAD experience. This is the International Registry of Aortic Dissection that I started in uh, 1994. And you see that over, over the years, the percentage of patients who die from type A dissection has dropped from 29% to 21%. If you look at the graph on the left, even more important um, is the fact that uh, the number of patients who are getting surgery is going up. And that's because our surgeons around the world are taking on more difficult patients, maybe older patients. And this is leading to improvement in outcomes. Those type A dissection patients, uh, even if they're uh, with a stroke or if they have coma, we think that their chance of surgery is really better than we thought in the past. And so more and more of them are getting an operation. And that's important. And, and our imaging is getting faster and better. And so we're finding them quicker. This is just so reassuring. And that is that uh, over the years that we've been following this disorder and this current data from you know, thousands and thousands of patients, um, the operative mortality, if we can get patients to the operating suite with type A dissection is now down to 12% around the world and even lower perhaps in the most highly experienced centers. This is really great news and is an example of how both awareness, science, uh, and really courage by lay organizations, research foundations, and, and physicians and, and nurses around the world are taking on this rare but deadly disease. For the long term, uh, patients who have had an aortic dissection require very careful management. Uh, we use drugs called beta blockers. Those drugs reduce the heart rate and the force of the heartbeat. And that tends to, we think, reduce the chance that the aorta will enlarge or tear again. We want the blood pressure to be great if a patient has had an aortic dissection, both acutely and then chronically. And so we use medications of various types to keep that blood pressure down. And we want a patient with an aortic dissection to have a blood pressure, that upper number, that's called the systolic blood pressure. We want that to be under 120 millimeters of mercury for life. That can require three, four, or even five different classes of medications to manage. We also ask our patients who've had an aortic dissection not to lift heavy things or engage in sports where they might get bumped to their chest because we think those two types of activities may increase the chance that the aorta would enlarge or tear again. And we follow their aorta very carefully. We use imaging over time to watch, to see if the aorta is enlarging or they're forming an aneurysm in another part of their aorta. This long-term surveillance of both blood pressure, heart rate, symptoms, and imaging allows us to find and anticipate future trouble where we may need to do other types of treatment to improve the patient's health. You know, the future, is incredibly bright to make further inroads in identifying, preventing, and treating aortic dissection. The work finding the genetics, improvements in imaging, improvements in the use of biomarkers that allow us to diagnose and or manage patients over time. These are proteins that we measure in the blood. Our ability to understand the patients who survive and how we can further influence their quality of life is really important. And those are all areas of emerging science that we're trying to promote as we go forward. You know, I've shown you um, a lot of data today, and uh, this, is not, this is not my work. This is the work of literally dozens and dozens of physicians, surgeons, nurses, research investigators around the world. The International Registry of Aortic Dissection currently has 60 centers in the world, and we are working together with agencies like the Marfan Foundation, the John Ritter Foundation, and scientists around the world to try to get a better understanding for this rare but life-threatening condition and how to do a better job of taking care of it. During this week, uh, raising awareness about aortic disease, it's really important that we work together to understand it, uh, to try to educate ourselves about ways of getting better, and I'm committed to that. The, the teamwork and the never-ending commitment to improve, these are the features that are so vital to our work. I want to congratulate uh, Amy Asbeck and the John Ritter Foundation especially today for their passion and persistence in fighting this rare condition um, and in a way honoring John Ritter and uh, his life uh, for the, the possibilities that others will benefit later. Uh, thank you and I hope you have a safe and pleasant fall.